Hello, friends. Hello, Facebook friends. Hello, YouTube friends. Very good evening to you. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths. This is episode 98. This evening, we have changed the topic. The plan was to talk about the annals of Ulster, but then the big story broke. One that I knew was coming, but uh, I just didn't exactly know the hour. And I hope that you've seen it by now. It's being reported across the world already in the world headlines. And that is major news in relation to uh, Newgrange and particularly uh, one of the burials there. Uh, and so we are going to devote tonight's episode to that news pertaining to the alleged relationships uh, and the familial status of those who are buried in Newgrange. And the implications for our understanding of the monument. This is huge news. I can't understate it. It is massive news in archaeology. It is news that, quite frankly, we've been waiting a generation for because the monument of Newgrange was excavated in the 1960s and the 70s. And the bones that were tested recently were retrieved from the chamber in the 1960s by Professor O'Kelly. And only now... Uh, what is it? Uh, not far off 60 years, but well, between 50 and 60 years later are they being tested. Uh, and the revelations are very exciting on the one hand, but also will require me to revise some of what I've written in my books. But anyway, we'll get to that momentarily. In the meantime, Austin Davies is the first of the commenters on YouTube tonight. Falcha Austin. Daisy Peter says, brightest blessings from me and from Rio de Janeiro. Giagutch, Cade Mila Falcha, my dearest two of the Netflix. Falcha Daisy, you're welcome along. Flower Child says, Falcha from Las Vegas. Happy to hear more great news about Newgrange. Well, we're happy to uh, 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 distill some of that news. I'm not sure whether you'd call it great. It depends on your uh, on your position, but it, it's interesting nonetheless. Mandy McCurl says hello from a sunny Isle of Mull. Good evening, Mandy Falchett. Jackie Stevenson says, hello, Anthony on the two. It sounds like a great episode. Well, hopefully it will be. As I say, it is kind of earth shaking in a way. And we'll get to that. The Full Irish says, Falcha and good evening from Tala. Good evening to you. And on YouTube, Guido Bruce is the first of the notifications. Good evening, Guido. Angel Barboni Smith says, hello, Falcha. Raymond Lawson says, greetings. I'm on time. Good stuff. Giagrich, Raymond. Jules Cousins says, hello, Giagrich. Camilla Relland is watching. Hello, Camilla. Maureen O'Leary says she's excited for this episode. I can barely sit in my chair. Irish myth proven true again. Haven't heard, but I hope they're continuing to work on more skeletal remains so we'll get more illuminating reports soon. Yes, indeed. Long T Men OC is in the house. Hello, Long T. Kristen Gray Tiger says, Gia Rival, I can't wait to hear the news about the news from Newgrange. Hi, Kristen. Tom King is watching. Hello, Tom. Megan Walter says, Greetings all, Gia Grich. Barbara Barney says, Hi, Anthony. Falcher, Barbara. Elaine Dint. Gent Lingenfelter says, hello, Anthony, from a very hot Whitney, Texas. Nice and hot here today, but we did have some rain this morning. Federica Guy says, hi, Anthony. Hi, Tua. I'm glad to be here again. Lots of greetings from Italy. Ciao, Federica. Donna Jean Porter says, hi, Giagrich. Josephine Meehan says, good evening, Anthony and Tua. End of exams and good news. Yes, brilliant. Patricia Langton is watching. Hello, Patricia. Good evening. Camilla says, this is huge news. So exciting. Yes, indeed it is. Margaret Ring is watching. Falcher, Margaret. Jennifer Ho says, Aloha, Anthony. Thank you so much for all of this. Aloha, Jennifer Falcher. Good evening. Tronona. Sorry, Tronona. Triana Ni Erk says, hello, lovely to a Falcher. Uh, uh, Arash uh, Triana. Konosata to Alwyn Roy Badziak says, hello, Anthony, and to an exciting news tonight. Yes, indeed. Margaret Kiernan says, evening, Anthony, to a Yeah, big news. And I just shared it on Facebook. Brilliant, Margaret. De Debbie Daly says, hi, Anthony, and to a Giagrich. Tracy O'Connor says, momentous day, especially coming up to the solstice. Yes, indeed. A couple of days until the sun is standing still. Interesting day, says Paula Snow Queen. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, Margaret Ring says, good evening, Anthony, and all the lovely two of Falcher, Margaret. Jennifer Foley says, hello, everyone. Gia Rich, Michael Naylor, Mike and Jeanette, who are in Princeton, New Jersey, say, lovely to be here with you all, with all you wonderful people. And we're very happy to have you wonderful people along. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony, and the mighty two of what great news you bring. Looking forward to story time. Mm, slightly different, slight departure from the script tonight, one could say. Rowan Grove says, fascinating developments. Greetings to all. Falcher Rowan, Scott Taggart says, turns off. The show, short Lynn and turns on Mythflix. Good stuff. Alex Casterton says, hello, Anthony and Tua, Falja, Alex. Julie King says, shook from all the revelations. Yeah, it's a big deal. Julianne Osborne is watching. Falja, Julianne. Paul Garron says, good evening, Tua, Anthony. Exciting news today. By the way, this episode is entirely unscripted. I haven't had enough time to really settle my thoughts on it. I was working 
And as soon as I finished work this evening, this news broke and I had to get a version of it up on the blog and I had to get the graphic redone and all the rest. And I forgot to do the YouTube one until the last minute and all the rest. So, uh, but unscripted is usually good in fairness. Paul Garren says, good evening, Anthony. Uh, good evening to uh, and Anthony. Exciting news today. Yes, indeed, Paul. Good to see you. Patricia McAteer is in the house. Volcha. Ralph Waldron is in from Off League. Connors to talk to Ralph. Janet Moran says hello, Anthony and Tribe. Looking forward to hearing about the news. Another beautiful and sunny Boston day. Volcha, Janet, I realize I should just slow the pace a little bit. It's like, yes, Anthony, you're excited. Just calm. There's plenty of time. Patricia Lochran McTague says hello, everyone. Volcha, Patricia. Scott Taggart says, Gio Gitch, Anthony, did you get my questions? I uh, don't think so. Uh, what way did you send them? Uh, Patricia McAteer says, hi all, Gio Gitch. Declan Sexton says, hi Anthony, good afternoon from Ontario, Canada, formerly from County Clare. A very good evening to you, Declan. Welcome along. Make yourself comfortable. Nick Esca Casterton says, good evening, Anthony, on the tour. Hope you're all in fine fettle. Well, we are, and greatly energised about tonight's topic. Philomena Breen says, Falcher from an undecided weather Wirral. Pardon me. It's a little bit hit and miss, isn't it, Philomena? It is here too. Yvette Tillema says, hi all, Falcher. Julie King says, hello from a very wet Nina. Banakti, Julie. Uh, Fawn Solo says, hello from Spain. Trononoa, Fawn, welcome along. Joy Buckner Winkles says, whoops, I said hello twice yesterday. Excited about today's episode. That's all right. I sometimes say hello back twice to people i'm sure nobody cared nobody minds too much sandra patterson says evening anthony and the tour fall to sandra great to see you Anne mccallum says hello anthony and the mighty tour from another warm sunny day in ontario good more good stuff today yes indeed and welcome along matthew bessel says launch anthony hope you received my email asking for gay kelts weaving Graw, beautiful sunny weather on king island i'll have to check that matthew i oh, have to apologize as i always do i have a mass of correspondence and i uh, struggle to keep up with it uh, as you can imagine uh, still working full time and everything else uh, so I'll, I'll get around to it as the man says Kelly Edmiston says good evening to my good folk of the Boyne hello Kelly great to see you Susan Scott says hello Anthony and all the two this week I've had to focus on studio work these afternoons so I've been catching up on Mythflix online but I'm here today on this bright blue sunshiny day in Connecticut happy to be with you all and happy to have your sunshine along in the house Susan the sun is actually shining in the window as we speak here in Glan in the Boyne in the Boyne Valley what is the breaking news I wonder Paul in Galway City sit tight Paul we'll all will be revealed shortly Jim Conway says he's under heavy showers in Lurgan uh, just don't swing a golf club and don't stand under a tree and you'll be all right, uh, Jim. Hope you're keeping well. Rex Fortenberry says, howdy from Louisiana. Geoglitch, Rex. Claudie Renault says, hello from France. Bonsoir, Claudie. Trononawa, welcome. Uh, Jacinta Paisley says, hi, Anthony. I'm on time this evening. Excellent. So am I. <laughs> Neil Hughes says, Trononawa, Anthony from Coatbridge, Scotland. Mary and I are all set for this episode. Hello, Mary. Hello, Neil. I've missed what the news is. My system was playing up. Well, just you just get comfortable there now and you'll hear. Hi, all. I just saw that. Interesting, says Margaret McKenna. Long team Menosi says, hi, Anthony and fellow Tua. So the Neolithic elite enjoyed a taboo-free status. No change there then. Lorna Evers, Mon well, I would say that there's no Neolithic elite anymore. <laughs> That's 5,000 years ago. But yes, I understand what you mean. Lorna Evers, Monaghan says, hello. Finally made it back. Hello, Lorna. Great to see you. Uh, and Lorna is from Glan, Bonya, only a short distance away. Peter Kennedy says, good evening, Anthony, from Ballybrigan Bal in Dublin. Hello, Peter, in North County, Dublin. Veronica Casey says, hello, Anthony, and all geoglitch, Veronica. Claudie Renault says, you're speaking so fast. Yes, that's what happens, I said, when I get excited. I will slow down for a moment. Janet Moran says, hope. Hope you'll mention, yes, I will, Janet, I will. And I did take note of that. Very interesting. Michelle Alou says, Geoglitch Anthony from Ashbourne in Meath. Hello, Michelle, Falje. Uh, Kiljeblon. Martin Doheny says, good evening, Anthony, and all the two are Falje, Martin. Paul Murphy is watching. He may or may not be my father. Hello, Dad. <laughs> Everybody say hello to Dad. That's my dad right there. James Jeremiah Langton is in Leakslip in Kildare. Fall to James. Good evening to you. Mariana Dunn says hello, dear Tua from Virginia. Exciting news. Yes, indeed. Gillian Smith, certainly an interesting one, isn't it? Just Gillian. Well, we'll 
crack open that uh, can of worms in a moment and uh, see where the worms make their way to. Rob Whelan says, hi, Anthony, big news. Greetings from your Meath neighbour. Hello, Rob, fault you. Mark Munoz says, hello all from New Mexico. Mark, wondering, did you get your book in the post? You might just let me know. Hopefully it arrived safely. I know some postal services, Australia, are not accepting uh, packages at the moment. But I think the ones to and from the States are maybe a little bit delayed. Veronica Casey said, oh, I saw something today. Trinity College. I wonder what it could be. Yes, indeed. William Bryan says, watching in Tennessee. We're great, grateful for your presence, William. Marcia Montero says, hello, how are you? Uh, Mar Marcia from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Falsha, good evening or good good afternoon. or Is it good morning there? It's certainly good um, yes, it's good afternoon, isn't it? Hello, Marcia. Regina Riley says, hello all, and good evening. Margaret Ring says, Ken Williams is in the henge. I did not see that. Welcome, Ken. Hello, Ken. Ken, if, if he hangs around, will be able to add quite a lot to this discussion, I reckon. Uh, and uh, Ken's photos were used in the article in Nature. I haven't seen the original article, but I've seen the photographs, and they are spectacular. Tell us, Myth, you're the Mythflix man. Tell us story tonight. We're all in the mood for story. And you make us feel all right. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of stories too. It's not all, uh, you know, uh, the the old facts of, of uh, genetics and archaeology. Brona Murray says, hello, Anthony from Belfast. Good evening, Brona Falchi. You're welcome along. Uh, Brita Merkel says, hello from Seattle. Thank you so much for filling us in on this exciting news. Falchi, Brita, nice to see you. Kirsten Salisbury is in the house. Hello, Kirsten, welcome back. Aidan Fahey says, hi, from the wee county on Lou. Ah, another wee county you're in the house. Brilliant stuff, Aidan. Nice to have you along. Mark says, what? Thought this was your full-time job. No, nope. believe it or not. Cy B says, good evening. Looking forward. Hello, Cy. Welcome back. Haven't seen you in a while. Ben Hancock says, hello, everyone. Follows you. Connie Keeler says, good afternoon from Ontario, Canada. Quite a few Ontario Ontarionians in the house this evening. Hello, Connie. Cyrene Curran says, checking in from Seattle and a few Seattleians as well. Falsha. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Adina Sparks says, good afternoon to Anthony and all the two of Falsha. Adina, Paula Snow Queen's waving at Dad, as is Veronica and Scott. Michael Freeman is watching. Michael Freeman and Paul Murphy. I suspect you two might know each other. I think you might. I'm sure your paths have crossed at some point in the past. Everybody's saying hello to Anthony's dad. Hello, Paul Murphy. You have a fine, generous intelligence. Of Rowan, will you stop? I'm not paying you to say that. Uh, I must be catching up on a lot of... Wow. Greetings from Montreal, says Robin Edgar. No doubt you'll be touching on probable connections between the Doubt Solar Eclipse myth and this recent discovery. Oh, of course, yes. Mary McLean says, good evening, Anthony, and across from across the ocean in Austin, Texas. Hello, Mary. Yes, a lot of uh, greetings to Mr. Dad. He's embarrassed now, I'm sure. Pawji pa McAvoyle says, Trononua Anthony August Natua. So there were god kings in Erin before Egypt. Looks like Princess Skota was returning with Stone of Destiny to the land of her ancestors. Interesting stuff, isn't it? In the Henge. Love that, says Patricia. Elaine, I'm not immediately, I have to say, uh, familiar with that gentleman. Uh, I know the name, but I don't know him, as it were. Uh, Barbara Kling says hello from Vermont, where it's a beautiful day. Brilliant stuff. Good afternoon, says Marcia Montero. Gillian uh, Smith is watching again. Uh, must have got disconnected. Sláin Um Lo Lois McCardle says good afternoon from Sw Swartz. Is it Swartz or Swartz? Swartz, L.A. Uh, is that Louisiana? Hello, Lois. Folge. Valentina Bernardi says hi to Jules. Good stuff. Yes, uh, Carol Barrett is saying hello from Galway. Hello, Carol. Jules Cousins is waving at someone else. Not me, but I'll wave anyway. Kimberly uh, is saying hello from Morocco. Hello, Kimberly. We're delighted to have you along. Mary R Rouse says hi from Indianapolis in Indiana. Follow you, Mary. Hope you're keeping safe and well. Um, we're coming hot and heavy on the old uh, comments here. Archaeoastronomy Database says hello on... YouTube, as does Mez Marion. Hello, Mez Marion. And the Woodsies from Monaster Boyce are in the house. Falls you. The Doodles says fascinating and exciting news from Newgrange today. Yes, indeed. 
Well, I certainly think so. Dawn Conyers says, this made my day. If I can't be in Ireland, then this brings me pretty close. Thanks for doing this. No problem. Elise Maloney says, hello. I'm so excited for today's news. Looking forward to tonight's episode. Yeah, I think a lot of people are excited. Oshin Lally says, hello all. Finally, I'm a little less certifiable with my friends. Falcha Oshin. A great mythical name, that Oshin. Uh, Rachel and Marcus are in Belfast. In Belfast, Tawn, I'm sure the Holland August Tawmich Sosta Ski Aligan. Well, I'm very glad to hear it and make yourselves comfortable. Learn to write videos. Who's been watching a lot of mythical Ireland videos lately? Says hi all, hi dad, and hi Anthony. The man so wise, his forehead has abs. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Erica, the two Ericas are in the house. Are they? Did I say hello to Erica Rivertree uh, and uh, Erica Bow? I may not have. If I didn't, I do apologize. Anyway, what, Pat Rowan has joined us. Hello, Pat. Hope you're keeping her between the ditches. Uh, let's call it 1545. So just as we were preparing to talk about the annals of Ulster this evening, the uh, very exciting news broke. Now, I have to be honest that I knew this was happening. Um, Dr. Laura Cassidy from Trinity College Dublin gave a talk at the Pleasant Boyne event in Slane, which was actually the last sort of uh, proper public event I was at uh, before the COVID situation developed a couple of weeks later. And uh, she did reveal a few things there, but she asked us not to say anything about that, that uh, to the public. Uh, myself and Ken Williams uh, shared uh, lunch with her and several of the other speakers at that event. I was actually one of the speakers. I was sp speaking about uh, drought archaeology and the discovery of monuments through uh, drones and satellite imagery. And I was very excited when she said, or when she gave an indication that this was going to be coming out into the public. So uh, what has happened, quite simply, is that a group of scientists uh, led by Trinity College Dublin and including Dr. Cassidy and others, uh, basically got hold of a bone sample that was retrieved from New Grange during the excavations. Now, the excavations happened a generation ago. The excavations began in 1962, and uh, the bone material I gather, Cheryl Ann McFetridge is in the house, Volge, uh, the bone material I gather was retrieved in the 1960s in the sort of the first a stage of the excavations rather than the uh, the latter stage in the 70s. Now that those bones have been carefully minded uh not quite I don't think we could say the same for the Carroll Keel bones that RAS McAllister retrieved from one of the cairns there in 1911 because they went missing for a while and were eventually found again. And I think we were kind of leaning towards certain conclusions when the uh, uh, study a few years ago about the Carroll Keel bones was released, which uh, indicated sort of familial relations in, in those that were buried in them. But today's news is exceptional in that what it indicates is that um, the, the, the adult male who is represented in the sample uh, Let's say that uh, his parents were very, very closely related. Uh, and it's exciting, uh, of course, and it's fascinating, of course. What it probably does, it, it, this news doesn't immediately sort of tie up loose ends. It doesn't immediately answer all the questions. Uh, it probably raises as many questions as it answers. But what it does is it helps us lean towards a hypothesis and you'll remember we had a discussion and a long number of episodes ago, and I read from my book, Mythical Ireland, and I was talking about whether the community of the Neolithic, whether the people who built the monuments did so out of some common community zeal, uh, or whether perhaps they were forced into doing so, that perhaps they were slaves to a master. Now, I'm not saying for a second that today's news definitively answers that one way or the other, but it certainly does kind of make us lean a little bit more in one direction. So anyway, I'm going to first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to re read the statement that was released from the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht, uh, which contains the key information. And then we'll explore in a little bit more depth. I don't have access to the article in Nature, the journal Nature. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I suspect the major details have all been captured in the uh, press coverage, 
um, there was obviously a, a carefully crafted release of all this because um, no sooner had the National Monument Service uh, and uh, the department uh, released the information than it began to appear uh, in various news sources all over the world. I suppose the first thing that needs to be said is that it's fascinating that we've come this far, uh, we're in the year 2020, that we've come this far without there having been a DNA study of the bone samples that were retrieved from the Chamber of Newgrange. It's not like genetics is a new area of research. Uh, it has been revealing quite a lot uh, in recent years uh, and uh, casting light on ancient mysteries. The big mystery of Newgrange, uh, one of the big mysteries is who built it? Uh, uh, we, we, we know we think we know a lot about where they came from. We think we know a lot about the sort of people that they were. They were farmers. Uh, they were astronomers, undoubtedly. Um, uh, but who were they really? And who were the people who were buried in the high status monuments? Uh, it would appear to have been, um, uh, uh, as I think we've commented on in... Uh, Hello, Ken. <laughs> Great to see your wonderful photographs in nature. Uh, fantastic stuff. Um, sorry, I'm trying to gather my thoughts here, you know. Uh, it's totally unscripted. Uh, one of the things that we've been wondering uh, for decades is, you know, who, who was buried in the major tombs? Like in the giant she or passage mounds, uh, there are three what we call mega mounds in... Uh, Bruna Bonia, um, uh, Newgrange, Nowth and Douth. There was tremendous physical exertion and effort and organisation put into them. We have addressed the issue in a number of episodes about how that uh, human labour was marshaled. Uh, and that isn't particular to the time frame we're talking about, which is around about 3200 BC, around 5200 years ago, 52 centuries ago. Uh, it, it continued into the late Neolithic because we now know, uh, thanks to recent revelations, uh, that there was a very, very significant late Neolithic complex at Newgrange as well, which, which would have commanded huge... Um, labor and uh, human endeavor and uh, input etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you go back in time to this period of 5200 bc you find large tombs passage tombs chambered cairns and the mythology calls them the she si father dhe or in old irish or in early irish si father d uh, you find the large ones but you find them surrounded by a complex of smaller ones in the case of Nouth, at least 18 satellites. And in the case of Newgrange, there are four in the immediate vicinity of the main mound. And at Douth, where there hasn't been excavation in recent times, it is, in my opinion, highly likely that we will find several more satellite uh, Neolithic tombs there. Um, yes, uh, and of course, there's a whole point in here that Megan is just making, and that is that there's no need for forced labour in a society that genuinely reveres their elites. But I suppose we... We'll, we'll, we'll kick that one around a little bit um, and uh, we'll see just what people think about that. Um, it's, it's interesting. The secrets of the bones, scientific research of ancient burials, sheds a remarkable light on Ireland's prehistoric society. An international team of archaeologists and geneticists led by Trinity College Dublin has shed fascinating new light on the Society of Ireland's first farmers in the Neolithic period, and that is roughly 4,000 BC to 2500 BC. An article published today in the leading journal Nature reveals the remarkable results of scientific analyses of human remains excavated from key national monuments across the country. Remember, this doesn't just relate to Newgrange, but of course I am uh, most <coughs> excited about the Newgrange revelation. Among their stunning findings is the discovery that an adult male buried in the heart of the Newgrange Passage Tomb around 3200 BC may have been among a ruling social elite. Other ruling dynasties from the archaeological world include the Inca god kings and Egyptian pharaohs, though the Irish Neolithic period is much earlier than those civilizations. 
Analysis of the skeletal remains of this adult male, which were retrieved during archaeological excavations led by Professor M.J. O'Kelly at the UNESCO World Heritage Site in the 1960s. Uh, I should note that it wasn't a World Heritage Site in the 1960s. It only received that status in the early 1990s. Marks him as the offspring of a first order incestuous union, meaning in plain language, his parents were very closely related. The BBC's report into this has gone one step uh, further, saying that his parents were first degree relatives, possibly brother and sister, which is very interesting. Hold that thought. Such unions are a near universal taboo for biological and cultural reasons. Though given his privileged burial within the chamber of the Newgrange Monument, his parentage was very likely to have been socially sanctioned. The Trinity College Dublin Research Group notes that socially sanctioned mating of this nature is very rare. And in global scientific studies has been documented almost exclusively among political religious elites, specifically within royal families that are headed by God kings. In globally documented cases of this, such as in Hawaii, the Inca Empire, and in ancient Egypt, such behavior is typically limited to ruling families whose perceived divinity exempts them from social convention. Researchers have generally viewed such close unions as a means of intensifying hierarchy and legitimizing power. The evidence from this study suggests a similar dynamic may have existed here in Ireland during the Neolithic period, which heralded the introduction of farming and saw the construction of large megalithic burial and ritual monuments. Now go on, I'm asking you just right now uh, to, to just ad admit it. Uh, I'm, I'm putting my hand up straight away. I told you before, I went, I went on the side of we're all in this together. I didn't I, I didn't favour the idea, and I, I'm not saying that this definitively answers it, but how many of you are sitting there going, oh, man, I didn't expect that. Um, it has been said, uh, and it has something, it's something that I've included in my writing without sort of definitively concluding anything from it, uh, that it has been said that, where you see giant monuments being built in, in any uh, historic or prehistoric culture, um, you you get a a a, a societal structure. Um, and didn't we say in our episode was it was that about the Dinshenicus and about Douth? I can't remember exactly what episode it was, but didn't we say that? You know, I, I often wondered about. Uh, Bresal Bodibad, the king who was supposed to have commanded all the, all the men of Ireland to come and build Douth, uh, as to whether they came willingly and were happy to be part of this, or whether uh, they 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 were driven to it uh, under the cosh uh, uh, at the end of a whip or whatever. Uh, so it's interesting because it gets you thinking about these things while it doesn't necessarily answer them definitively. <clears throat> And, and this is where I was delighted to see in a National Monuments and uh, Department of Heritage report, uh, talking about archaeology and mythology in the same sentence is so wonderful. This suggestion of a close family royal dynasty during the middle of the Neolithic period coincides with the building of the great passage tombs of Newgrange, Nowth and Douth, and echoes medieval folklore associated with the World Heritage Site of Brunagonia. And we've often said, haven't we? Yes, the mythology was written down in medieval times, that doesn't make the mythology medieval. It probably goes back into the deep, deepest mists of time. The 12th century book of Leinster, and he's specifically talking here about the Dunchanicus, records the tale of a union between a sister and a brother which lent itself to the ancient name for Douth. And the story of Douth uh, uh, in, in very condensed form is that the king, Bresal Bodibad, brought all the men of Ireland, doesn't say anything about the women, brought all the men of Ireland together to build him a tower from which they could pass to heaven uh, to, to ensure that this task would be done as, uh, efficiently. Um, uh, the king's sister cast a spell on the sun to make it stand still in the sky so that there would be endless day for the task. However, the king and his sister go off and commit incest at a place called Ferta Kulia, and we'll examine the possible uh, meaning of that name in a moment. 
Uh, and in the committing of their incest, the magic spell was broken. A sudden darkness descended upon the place. And the men said, well, we were promised endless day for this task. And because day is gone and night has come, we are going to abandon this place. And forevermore, it shall be called Doa, uh, which means darkness or darkening. Uh, now, there's obvious eclipse mythology there. Um, but there may be some deeper, uh, more substantial truth in the myth uh, that we perhaps hadn't anticipated in previous times. The team of scientists also revealed a web of distant familial relations between the man buried at Newgrange and other individuals buried at passage tombs across the country, namely the cemeteries of Carrow Moor and Carrow Keel in County Sligo and the, to and the tomb at Millen Bay in County Down. The genome survey led by Trinity College Dublin stretched over two millennia and unearthed other spectacular results. Sorry, I, I, that's my, I don't know, that's a Freudian slip. The word is unexpected results. <laughs> I, I just blurted out spectacular there because that's what I think they are. Within the oldest known burial structure on the island, Polnabrone portal tomb in the Burren, built around 3800 BC, the earliest yet diagnosed case of Down syndrome was discovered in a male infant buried there. Isn't this just incredible? what we are able to ascertain now using modern science. The remains were excavated by Dr. Anne Lynch of the National Monument Service in the 1980s as part of urgent conservation work at the Spectacular Burial Monument. See, there's that word. They definitely, it's definitely their word this time. Isotope analyses of this infant showed a dietary signature of breastfeeding. In combination with being afforded burial in the chamber, an honour afforded to very few, the researchers suggest this provides an indication of care and that visible difference was no barrier to prestige burial. Additionally, the genetic analyses showed that the monument builders were early farmers who migrated to Ireland and replaced the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who preceded them, preceded them. The scientific evidence suggests that there was a swamping of the earlier population rather than any forced displacement or extermination, which is another huge question that we've suddenly uh, taken a, a giant leap towards answering. A question that I addressed in my book, Newgrange Monument Immortality, which now needs significant updating. <laughs> it's fascinating how many people have to rewrite. I told you before about um, uh, J.P. Mallory of Queen's University when, when he, he released the first uh, hardback edition of... Um, uh, uh, who are the what is it called who are the Irish uh, the origins of the Irish uh, and a few years later as a result of uh, uh, new information about genetics and DNA he had to substantially revise one of the chapters and in one of his own talks on YouTube you can watch it yourself he said he had to revise said chapter because it now turned out that it was absolute shite <laughs> he used that word himself um, so several several uh, of the archaeological uh, community and the anthropologists and uh, the experts who've been writing about Newgrange for decades are suddenly scrambling to their writing desks uh, to uh, significantly revise their texts. <laughs> Additionally, uh, sorry, uh, the findings are dramatic in the ever dynamic retelling of our past. The results will hopefully lead to further research on other human remains, which will help tell us even more of the people of ancient Ireland and their society. While we do already know much about the monuments they built, some of them are most prized national monuments in state care. We still know relatively little about those who built them. As scientific endeavour grows and ever more complex analytical possibilities develop, we have the potential to learn much more. The research was funded, it's important to say this too, by a Science Foundation Ireland slash Health Research Board slash Wellcome Trust Biomedical Research Partnership Investigator Award to Professor Dan Bradley and an earlier Irish Research Council Government of Ireland scholarship to Lara, Dr. Lara Cassidy of TCD. And we take off our hats and bow to their expertise and their wonderful detective work in bringing this information to us. Lots of people, you're going to be talking quite a lot among yourselves there for a little while. Uh, and it's great to see the commentary flowing. Uh, there is going to be a significant debate around uh, uh, this. 
in in terms of you know the egalitarianism and you know the idea of you know a community endeavor in building these monuments i still am inclined to think that um it wasn't so much a thing about slavery uh, it, I, 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 I don't it seems to me that the monuments are a, 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 an expression of uh, a creative, a cultural, an artistic, a spiritual zenith, uh, you know. Uh, but we have also addressed the possibilities, haven't we, that uh, the need to build bigger monuments might have stemmed from something else, like the worsening of the climate, for instance, uh, a greater uh, need to appease the gods, What's interesting about all this, too, is if they were God kings, you know, does that mean one of the men, this man who was buried in Newgrange, was he was he one of these God kings that was actually called the Dogda or was he called Elkmar or was he called Angus? You know, fascinating. The BBC has a very interesting uh, and quite comprehensive article, given that uh, I presume they had sight of this stuff a little bit earlier in the day, if not a few days ago. It's one of the earliest examples of such a hierarchy among human societies. A key piece of evidence comes from an adult male buried at the 5,000-year-old Newgrange Monument. His DNA revealed that his parents were first-degree relatives, possibly brother and sister. Brother and sister, Bressal and his unnamed sister, by the way, in the Douth myth, uh, being the ones who were uh, 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 allegedly responsible for bringing the darkening upon that place. We should probably turn to the Dinchenicus right now and read that uh, myth, shouldn't we? So just to, just to uh, accentuate the importance of this, um, so I'll give you the myth about doubt as it is contained in the Dinchenicus poem about Nauth. The more detailed version of the doubt story is contained in the uh, Dinchenicus of Nauth. There is another tale tis known to me of that hill which Dovtok possesses. It was made through great exploit, sorry, though great the exploit, by Bressal Bodibad. And of course, if you've been following uh, Mythical Ireland uh, for a while, you'll know that Bressel Bodibad means lacking in cattle because of the cattle famine that happened at the time. In his time, there fell a moraine on kine, uh, and, and to use modern English, there fell a disease on the cattle. In every place in Ireland, except for seven cows and a bull that increased strength for every farmer in his time. By him is built the solid hill in the likeness of Nimrod's tower, uh, uh, Christian insertion there so that from it he might pass to heaven that is the cause why it was undertaken the men of all Aaron it, it, so, so even that speaks to us of a megalomaniac king who wants everybody to build a monument so that he can access heaven through it whatever you consider heaven to be and however far back this goes the men of all Aaron came to make for him that hill all on one day the white exacted from them hostages for the work of that day. And even that's interesting. It sounds, sounds like they were brought there against their will. His own sister said to him, she would not let the sun run his course. There should be no night but bright day till the work reached completion. And of course, my own interpretation of that is that is a summer solstice myth pertaining to the time of this time of year, by the way, when the sun is the sun is practically now standing still. It's rising and setting positions will not change for the next uh, probably five mornings. Uh, and of course, we don't get full darkness at night. Even in the middle of the night, there's a bright twilight and enough light to see what you're doing if you're working on some sort of great construction project outdoors. His sister stretches forth her hands. Strongly, she makes her druid spell. The sun was motionless above her head. She checked him on one spot. Bressel came. Lust seized him from the hill unto his sister, the host made of it a marvel. He found her at Fertakulje. He went in unto her, though it was a crime, though it was violation of his sister. On this wise, the hill here is called Fertakulje. When it was no longer day for them thereafter, it is likely that it was night. The hill was not brought to the top. The men of Aaron depart homeward. 
From that day forth, the hill remains without addition to its height. It shall not grow greater from this time onward till the doom of destruction and judgment. It is flammed here, bright his art, who tells this tale. No deceptive speech. A choice story. Spread it abroad, men and women. Lips make mention of it among excellences. And there you go. The story basically tells us that uh, lust seized the king and he, him and his sister mated. And the result of that was that the spell was broken and a darkness came upon the place. Of course, there is an astronomical or cosmological uh, 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 interpretation of that. The sun nearly always being male and the moon being female. The moon and the sun mate or come together in the sky and a sudden darkness comes and eclipse. Uh, perhaps it is also eclipse mythology. Uh, the, the, the gentleman uh, buried in Newgrange was one of an extended clan buried at impressive stone monuments across Ireland. This is also something that I didn't see in the National, uh, in the Department of Heritage uh, report, was that uh, the, re the researchers extracted DNA from 44 ancient individuals from across Ireland. Yes, someone is making a point there, which is very interesting. Julie King says uh, his possible parents... Um, it, is it? Yes. Sorry. Yes. You're. You're basically. Yes. It's. 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 It. It is. It apparently. The the DNA results apparently confirm the mythology. Um, which begs the question, in relation to Newgrange. Were Dogda and Bowen, brother and sister? It's never hinted at in the mythology. But there are similarities in the in that myth about how Dogda entered the house of Alkmaar at Newgrange uh, when the sun was standing still in the sky. There are similarities there with the Doubt mythology, which we, we've explored before. The researchers extracted DNA from 44 ancient individuals from across Ireland and sequenced their genomes, the full complement of genetic material contained in the nuclei of cells. Even that in itself is a huge uh, amount of work. Evidence of incestuous unions like that found at Newgrange are rare in human history. They are taboo for interlinked biological and cultural reasons. Where they do occur, it is often within royal dynasties that have been granted divine status. Among these cultures, rulers drew on aspects of religion to legitimise their power and wielded it through the construction of extravagant monuments. Uh, and who, who who of you who have visited Newgrange have not considered to, to be extravag extravagant, especially considering the narrative, which has always been, uh, and it would appear to be correct, that there were principally or primarily burial places? Question that's often asked, perhaps naively at times, but, but uh, sometimes in naivety there's a deeper truth, and that is, why would you go to all this bother to haul stones halfway across Ireland, or in some cases, uh, to build this giant monument? You know, that's just going to serve as a grave for a few people, you know? Well, I think now we may actually be leaning towards uh, something of an answer to that question. Lara Cassidy herself is quoted as saying she had never seen anything like it. We all inherit two copies of the genome, one from our mother and one from our father. Well, this individual's copies were extremely similar, a telltale sign of close inbreeding. In fact, our analyses allowed us to confirm that his parents were first degree relatives. In other words, to put that in plain English, brother and sister. And yet again, yet again, we see something suggested in mythology being borne out by the science. And it's easy to laugh, isn't it? And it's easy to kind of say, ah, yeah, so sure, they're only old stories. And sure, nobody knows where they came from and nobody knows how old they are. There's enough information in some of those myths to suggest that they are echoes from the, the deep past from the Neolithic, I think. Some of those myths talk about astronomical functions of the monuments. Um, in my opinion, that Dinshenica's tract in which uh, Dagda, who is a distinctly solar deity, enters the house of Elkmar uh, to meet with Bowen, uh, 
is 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 basically a poetic description of the winter solstice illumination of Newgrange. The prestige of the burial makes this very likely a socially sanctioned union and speaks of a hierarchy so extreme that the only partners worthy of the elite were family members. And that, that is uh, the words of Professor Dan Bradley of Trinity College. Uh, Dr. Cassidy says, it's an extreme of what elites do. Marrying within your kin group allows you to keep power within your clan. But elites also break lots of rules to separate themselves from the rest of the population. It's a bit chicken and egg. By breaking these rules, you probably make yourself seem even more divine. And didn't I say before, isn't there a possibility here too that these, let's call them uh, these uh, clan, uh, these familial uh, dynastic royal rulers of the time, isn't it a possibility that they or their druids or their high priests, whatever want you want to call them, their, their, their most learned scholars, were familiar with the, um, uh, the, the mechanization, the mechanics of the movements of the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars. And that in recording these, some of them had noted patterns. And through those noting of patterns, uh, they eventually were able to predict eclipses. And didn't we say before that it was highly possible that a person in the Neolithic who was able to predict an eclipse and who was able to say that the moon is going to turn blood red this Saturday, whenever, you know, in three days time, you know, in two days time, uh, the if you're in Africa, you will see the sun being covered by the moon, but not fully covered. You will see this ring of light uh, across the sky, uh, moving across the sky. Um, and somebody who's in a position to be able to predict that could make themselves very powerful if they kept the the details of how they predicted it a secret and, and made it into a sort of a, you know, uh, a, 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 almost like, a, you know, a superstition, as it were, rather than something that was uh, like a little bit like a conjurer or a magician who shows the trick to people to make them impressed and to wow them into putting some money into his hat at the end of the show but who doesn't reveal the secrets of how the tricks were done. Uh, and isn't it also a possibility that, you know, the very ab seemingly abstract nature of the megalithic art on the great monuments of, of Bruno Bonia, uh, you know, makes it uh, uh, almost impractical or impossible to decode. And those who have tried have found themselves in some cases clutching at straws, some uh, stones that appear to be readily um, uh, um, translated, as it were, uh, or deciphered into the language of astronomy, such as the calendar stone reference Martin Brennan's work, that those decipherments don't often carry to other stones featuring similar art. Is it a case that there were a certain elite who had the keys to the puzzle, who had the secrets and who retained them and maintained them in a close circle uh, of uh, royalty surrounded by their high priest slash druids slash insert word here. Um, and I'm, I'm, of course, speculating, and this is <laughs> speculation. But let's not forget for a moment, in amongst all the speculation, first of all, we have to marshal the facts together, and the facts are very interesting. And in marshalling the facts together, then we compare those with some of the oral uh, and written traditions of the site, uh, and we see very interesting information emerging. Uh, the BBC is reporting about the local myth. The story was first recorded in the 11th century AD, four millennia after the construction of Newgrange, and tells of a builder king who restarted the daily solar cycle by sleeping with his sister. And of course, don't forget that indeed that cycle was perhaps re being renewed because if it happened at the time of summer solstice, what happens immediately afterwards is the sun begins to retreat along the horizon again. Something Professor Ronald Hicks pointed out in a paper at least two decades ago, perhaps from, perhaps in the 1980s, actually. I think it's in the 1980s. Professor Ronald Hicks of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, who we've referenced in lots of episodes, uh, suggested that the legend, this, this legend of doubt was a legend about how the days darken and shorten 
as we move from summer towards winter. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. The Middle Irish place name for the neighbouring Douth Passage tomb, Ferta Chulia, is based on this lore and can be translated as Hill of Sin. Now, uh, the part referencing sin uh, and for it was a crime. One wonders now, uh, with regards to whether this, uh, you know, uh, this familial mating, this incestuous, these incestuous relationships of the Neolithic, whether it was so normalized that it wasn't considered uh, a violation. But uh, certainly the Denshanicus, which remember would have been written down by a Christian scribe in a monastery, and undoubtedly the Christian scribe had. Uh, uh, opinions as to the subject matter. He went in unto her, though it was a crime, though it was a violation of his sister. One wonders whether that is uh, an imposition of morals writing in the 11th or 12th century, or whether in fact uh, that was uh, uh, you know, a taboo of the time uh, that was carried forward. Yes. Anyway, sorry. More translation to be done there, I think, too. More modern translation. Uh, so the BBC asked for comment from uh, a senior research scientist at London's Francis Crick Institute who was not involved in the study. And he added, he says that given how remote these societies are from our own, I am wary of talking about dynasties or monarchs as we understand them today. And people anticipating a Neolithic Game of Thrones may have to have a cold shower. But certainly the evidence is quite convincing that certain megalithic tombs in Ireland were reserved for people who were biologically more closely related to one another, including potentially prestigious groups of families who married amongst themselves. And isn't that extraordinary, too, when you consider and, and something that we will turn to tomorrow? The episode we were supposed to have this evening was relating to the Annals of Ulster. And in the Annals of Ulster, there are lots and lots of cases where kings murdered other kings or a king was murdered by a, 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 a jealous would-be king. And where they didn't just kill the kings, they killed their sons or in some cases they put their eyes out. A very nasty thing, you know horrendous thing to think about and we'll get we'll get on to more about that tomorrow and so game of thrones suddenly comes back into the fray a little bit here that they did so in order to prevent that family group from retaining the uh, the kingship to make sure that not just the king had been cut off but that his heirs his male heirs were also either wounded and remember a wound uh, a deficiency, uh, any sort of a, a blemish uh, ruled you out for kingship, uh, exemplified in the very earliest stories of kingship, Nuadu of the silver arm, he who had to have his arm remade by his physician magicians uh, in order to regain the throne from Bress before Kot Moichura, before the second battle of Moichura. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that, and perhaps there's another study there to be done, uh, about the, the medieval lineages uh, and whether the kings of the early medieval period uh, were also in the same practice. But it just seems that um, the whole idea, the whole notion of the kings being buried at Brunabonia, that tradition, uh, which was a long and dearly held tradition of the peasantry, that Brunabonia was the place where the high kings of Tara was buried, uh, which had a lot of cold water poured on it by the archaeologists and the scholars over the past century or so, isn't all such a distant idea after all that perhaps they weren't necessarily, necessarily the burial places of the kings of Tara. They were the burial places of the very earliest kings of what we now call Meath, which was uh, in medieval times called Brea or Brega. Uh, and and it, it, it invites all sorts of speculation. Of course, much of it is speculation uh, about whether the people who who built Newgrange were building it for this these dynastic rulers. 
uh, it really is fascinating. The genetic ties between elite individuals at far-flung locations were not seen among contemporary burials at less prestigious sites, suggesting that it is more, more a phenomenon related to the larger monuments. It seems what we have here is a powerful extended kin group who had access to elite burial sites in many regions of the island for at least half a millennium, explained Dr. Cassidy. And Tim Booth says something interesting that in Britain, recent discoveries that some tombs were built over the remains of timber houses has been used to suggest that these sites were linked to particular families. But solid evidence for who ended up in these tombs and why has always been elusive. Another thing that I must insert here, I must reference here, it's very important to say it now actually, is it also gives rise to a discussion about why there were so few people found in Newgrange. So just for those of you who are unfamiliar with the excavation and the findings of the excavation of O'Kelly, uh, there was a relative paucity of human remains found in Newgrange for such a gigantic monument. One would expect, oh, this is a big place. Okay, high status. Okay, fair enough. One might have expected to find more. It has often been said that the reason more bones weren't found was because that it was reopened in 1699 as the result of uh, the uh, Presbyterian settler Charles Campbell's activities. He wanted to, 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 to borrow rob. He wanted to borrow stone from Newgrange uh, to build uh, his buildings and, and allegedly roads in the area. And um, the idea was that his his, his laborers would fetch stone from the cairn at Newgrange where a source was readily available but that shortly after beginning to take stone away they found the entrance uh, and uh, Edward Cloyd thankfully was in the area in 18, 1699 and documented Newgrange and seems to have prevented a further tragedy or a travesty in terms of the robbing of stone and perhaps the wholesale destruction of Newgrange in, in favour of somebody's new farmhouse. And it's often been said that because the monument was open for about two centuries, the first of the National Monuments Acts was passed in the 1880s, I think, putting it under the protection of the state. And of course, shortly thereafter, uh, the Hickeys uh, became the custodians and they held the key and it was locked by a gate and you couldn't just walk inside it. It's often been suggested that additional human remains that might have been in there uh, at the time uh, Campbell Campbell's labourers reopened the site in 1699 might have been carted off by visitors. However, this new information would, would tend to make one at least reconsider that in light of the possibility that, in fact, uh, there were very few individuals buried in there in the first place. <laughs> if they were part of a familial group, Remember that Newgrange and Brunabonia are at the latter end of the tomb building phase, which begins, well, I think there are some dates for Sligo, 3800, Polnabrone, or Polnabrone is 3800. You know, we're stretching back towards the earlier part of the Neolithic. If there was a disastrous change in the climate and, you know, that period where... Um, there's a distinct change in the sort of monument type that's being built. The, the late Neolithic phase begins. And those monuments are much more inclusive. They're what we call, what, we, what you might call outdoor gigantic monuments. Some of them of earth, some of them of timber. Uh, spectacular theatres, gladiatorial arenas, I don't know, sporting arenas, what you might call them, stadiums. Um, perhaps the fact that there were only five indi individuals found in Newgrange is because there were very few individuals buried in Newgrange because it was reserved for a particular very uh, tight uh, uh, group, familial group, uh, incestuous group, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that perhaps after a generation or two, um, the disaster of that, whatever, uh, whatever happened at the end of the Neolithic, Genetically, we now know, and this is why uh, J.P. Mallory had to re revise the origins of the Irish, is because it was always believed that the modern Irish were descended from the Mesolithic people, the people, the hunter-gatherers who were there before the farmers, before the mound builders, 
before these uh, people came along and built those great monuments. Uh, and uh, uh, new information came to light to show that, no, in fact, most modern Irish people are descended from the Beaker uh, culture, which is, you know, uh, the beginnings of the Bronze Age, the Copper Age. Um, and there's a very distinct change there because the people uh, who came to Newgrange, uh, the people who built the, the megalithic monuments, uh, came from a, a, a part of Europe uh, that we now call Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, uh, they were darker skinned and darker haired and shorter than the Beaker uh, people. And the Beaker people were, were generally taller, fair haired, blue eyed, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so uh, we, um, we had to significantly revise the history. And curiously in that case too, and this is something that I've written about, um, in that case too, the, the beliefs of the peasantry uh, in preceding centuries would certainly have been that the modern Irish are descended from the Gael, that is, the Milesians, that is, the sons of Meal, who, according to mythology, were the ones who came from Spain and took Ireland from the Tuatha de Danann, the Tuatha de Danann being the, the gods, the deities, the people who built the monuments. And there's a distinct changeover there uh, in mythology, where the de Danans agree to give the surface land to the Milesians and in return, the the, the Dedanans agree that they're going to retreat into the Shi or into the monuments. But there's also a distinct sort of changeover uh, in, in, in genetics, because we now know, as I said, that, uh, well, certainly in, in, in the context of Britain, and remember back in the Neolithic, the populations, I think, of the islands were much more closely related genetically, probably, than they are now. If I'm mistaken about that, that's my mistake. Uh, and I am generalizing a little bit. Uh, but in certainly in the case of Britain, the studies showed that 90% uh, of the Neolithic uh, genetics uh, vanished uh, and were largely replaced by uh, the, the beaker, what we might call the beaker genes. That invites similar speculation as to what's being speculated by uh, Dr. Cassidy's uh, research. And, um, and that is that perhaps there wasn't uh, an invasion, and this is another of the great mysteries and the, uh, 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 something that's been debated uh, up and down uh, across the decades and the years by various scholars, which is, you know, first of all, what happened? What happened in the crossover between the Mesolithic time and, and the Neolithic? Was there an incursion of some kind? Was there a large scale sort of coming of different people? Did they kill off the Mesolithic population? Did they just kill off the men and breed with the women? Did were there uh, were there other factors at play? Environmental factors, disease, um, you know, clim climatological factors. And of course, the same thing could be asked about the Neolithic and the decline of that great monument building era, which lasted for about a millennium, from about four thousand to three thousand BC, and that are the the, the, are the large stone monuments. Uh, you know, and the, the distinct, uh, it's not so distinct actually, uh, but that uh, uh, blurring of the eras between the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, the same thing happened there. You know, was there, a, was there an incursion? Was there some sort of a, a war between the peoples? Uh, was it just that there was a large amount of, of the, these new uh, beaker arrivers coming in? Was, it, was, was there a disease? Uh, was there an epidemic? That's also hinted at in the mythology, by the way. Um, there's lots of myths that talk about Partholon uh, and Nemed, weren't they? The two uh, peoples who were uh, almost completely, or in the case of the Partholonians, who were completely wiped out in the mythology, according to uh, Laura Gawala. Ken Williams says they were found scattered in the chamber, mostly around the side recesses. This particular man was found in the entrance area of the right recess. Thanks for that, Ken. I wasn't exactly sure from what they were saying today, exactly which recess. So that's uh, good information. Um, most exciting for me uh, is that, uh, yet again, the mythology seems to be confirmed by the science. Um, as much as uh, people don't seem to want to pay heed to it, and I'm not generalizing there because there are plenty of uh, academic archaeologists, by the way, who've taken an interest in mythology. Uh, it cannot be used as evidence, uh, 
uh, but it is still helpful, uh, as O'Kelly did when he was writing his Newgrange book, to include the old traditions of the site and to at least incorporate them into your thinking, you know. And I'm going to start reading some comments. Yeah, Ken is saying, and I think you're right, Ken, because that's what I've been reading, that only one individual from Newgrange was sequenced. Uh, remember, too, I don't know if you've seen my blog post about all this this evening, uh, hastily put together, I might add. Uh, but there's a photo there from the National Museum of some of the, the fragmented bone remains that were found at Dua Mamil, the Mound of the Hostages at Tara. I'm going to paste that in here as a comment, which would give you an indication of the sort of state that a lot of the bones are found in in these monuments. Very fragmented, very broken down, very small, such that it is difficult for the osteoarchaeologists, for the specialists, the forensic archaeologists, to say for certainty that this belongs to a man or a woman or a child, you know, and to say what sort of diseases they suffered from and what condition they were in at the time of their passing which is often possible when you have full skeletons, whether disarticulated or not. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a difficulty there. Uh, and there are probably lots of fragments there uh, that, you know, at the moment are a mystery. Who do they belong to? Uh, what part of the body do they belong to? Uh, it's great, finally, Finally, after decades and years and years in my own personal case of wondering uh, who were the people that were buried in Newgrange were closer to an answer at long last. Um, because um, we have never known. And as I said, the Carol Keel study a few years ago, um, cautious about mentioning names because I know there were a few good four or f at least four or five people involved in that study uh, i think robert hensey was included and johnny geber and a few others uh, i'm just cautious about naming some because i inevitably leave some out there was an indication that, th that there were familial graves that they were related but not I, I don't think the revelations were as sort of clear cut as this uh, in terms of the closeness of that relationship in the case of the man at newgrange I hope I'm not missing anything because there was, uh, as I said, totally unscripted. I didn't even take notes. Mark Munoz says cremation does destroy a lot of the findings. I mean, even in that regard, another mystery, an interesting mystery is as to why some of the, uh, the fragments are cremated and some uncremated. Why was there a difference in the way people were treated? You know, uh, what was, what was the, what was the thinking behind why some people people's corpses were processed a particular way, uh, you know? Were the bones carbon dated, asks Carol Barrett. That's... I'm, I'm assuming so because we're given this specific time frame of 3200 BC. I'm assuming so. It doesn't explicitly say it in the press releases. Uh, and as I say, I haven't had sight of the Nature uh, Journal article because I'm not a subscriber to the Nature Journal. Um, and perhaps um, just as Margaret King says, Coda is quiet tonight. He's barking because some dog has started outside and he's automatically answering can you hear him he's automatically answering uh, ken i'm not sure whether that's a question you can answer do we know were they definitively uh, carbon dated a few people are are um a few people are, are are asking that and i don't know the answer Yeah, Neil is talking about people, uh, invaders coming by sea. Yes, absolutely everybody who arrived into Ireland after the Ice Age came by sea. There was a debate that is still not settled entirely, but there was a debate as to whether there was a land bridge between Ireland and Britain uh, at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, but if you read uh, J.P. Mallory, uh, he, he seems to rule it out. Um, uh, so basically everybody who came after the Ice Age came across the sea 
But I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, my own view about about that is, I, I, don't, I don't see what the, I'm not. This isn't aimed at you, Neil. This is just in general. I don't see what the big deal is in terms of seafaring. In my opinion, and I've said it in previous episodes. In my opinion, human beings have been sailing the oceans for hundreds of generations, um, in all sorts of craft. Now, to get to the stage where you're building large seagoing sea craft to bring large stones uh, uh, weighing three and five and ten tons apiece. That's a different kettle of fish. Uh, but the simple act of crossing the sea and then perhaps bringing livestock, which the Neolithic people have to have done because there were no cows, and we know that from the archaeological record, there were no cows and there were no horses in Ireland before the Neolithic. There were uh, pigs or wild boar. Uh, which which was a staple diet before the Neolithic. So he, everybody has to have come across the sea. You're absolutely right. Just making sure there is no questions that I'm missing. I do apologize. Oh, yeah, I should check YouTube as well. Ken Williams says, Man from Newgrange seems to be dated around to around 3200 to 3100 BC. The graph with the data has fairly wide bands. Of course, that's always, isn't it? It's always an issue. It's plus or minus, isn't it, Ken? The, the, the dates are generally given as, you know, uh, 3000 plus or minus. And as you say, uh, 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 the bands can, can widen and narrow. That's BC, of course. Yes, indeed. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Catherine Woodruff has a comment. During desperate times, people can break taboos in order to promote survival or promote the return of better times. They are trying, trying to understand forces beyond us and get the weather spirits to return to a more helpful to human lives behavior. Yes, indeed. And of course, even that's hinted at in the mythology because uh, after the agreement was made between the Milesians and the Dedanans, the Dedanans interfered with the crops and, and uh, uh, weren't at all favorable uh, uh, towards the production of uh, a decent crop and a decent harvest. And the Milesians had to kind of plead with them again, didn't they? I can't remember if that's Laura Gowala. I think it is. Um, I will return to it. Something else it's interesting in that regard. The word, even the word taboos, gyesh or gyasa in Irish, there are so many gyasa or gyesh uh, for the for the kings uh, in the in the medieval lore pertaining to you know the kings of the Tara era. Uh, Conor Amor being the classic example and Dodd Durga's hostel. It is the breaking of his taboos that leads to the fall of his kingship. Um, so it's interesting, again, the parallels that are there. Now, they are slender and they are tenuous to an extent. But I, I, I feel something here of an opening up between the, the medieval mythology and the medieval kings uh, and uh, the earlier stuff. I think that there's a continuity there that we don't, uh, that is not perhaps... Of course, it's difficult to come down definitively on one side or another, uh, but it's perhaps not overlooked, but perhaps not even considered, you know. Jim Conway says the population was very small. It would be hard to avoid someone you're not related to. I wonder about that, too, because a lot of people have asked over the years, how many people built New Grange now and out? And the answer has always been, well, we don't really know. But if it was a small number of people, it took longer to build. And if it was a larger number, it took a shorter period. I think we're favoring now the larger number, uh, the late Neolithic complex. And again, we are talking about a, a sort of distinct time because there were, diff pardon me, different types of monument being built. But a lot of them, very massive monuments, requiring a similar input of labor. Uh, and the, the late Neolithic complex at Brunibonia is gigantic and in my opinion, because it is likely that a lot of those monuments stood together at the same time, uh, they are uh, they 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 weren't necessarily all built in the same year. Not don't get me wrong, but they're contemporary with each other generally. 
that would suggest to me a, a, a very sizable population involved in their construction. That doesn't mean that population lived locally, of course. Uh, reference the previous discussion about seafaring, it is possible that they came from long distances. We know, or at least we're fairly certain, that some of the stones for the monuments came long distances. So that suggests that some of the people who came there to build them came long distances. And there again, the mythology agrees. Bressel commanded all the men of Ireland to come to this place to build him a tower uh, from which he could pass to heaven. Water, sea and river transport would have been significantly easier than overland, says Karima Mc, McDwyer, BSC. Yes, uh, 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 absolutely, 100% uh, right. In the Neolithic, there were no roads. Uh, we, we have no evidence that the wheel was a thing in the Neolithic. They may have used log rolling to bring the stones from the river up to the sites. Perhaps the Mesolithic people were the Fuigiasa to the Neolithic to construct the brew. Interesting suggestion, Rob. Perhaps some of the uh, uh, the uh, remaining hunter-gathering community were marshaled together to build the monuments for the, for the new arrivers. Who knows? Uh, Margaret wants to know, how would this news be relevant to sites such as Loch Crew? Well, uh, they're relevant because... There are three sort of major clusters of sites, the Sligo cluster, the Loch Crew cluster and the Brunabonia cluster, notwithstanding stuff that has been destroyed. And there are other clusters, uh, such as the cluster of monuments that once topped, of which there are remnants, the Dublin and Wicklow Mountains, for instance. Uh, the reason it's relevant to Loch Crew is it, it, they're likely to have been built by uh, relatives because as hinted at in this, or I think as demonstrated by this research, uh, the man who was built in Newgrange was actually also related to the people who are found in the Sligo monuments, which are believed to be the oldest, and the sequence would generally be accepted as Sligo, and there are dates for Sligo, which, as I say, some of those are, I think, 38, am I right, Ken? 3800 BC uh, for Caramore. Uh, Loch Crew, which has never been excavated in the modern era, and for which, at this moment in time, we have no modern carbon dates. We have no carbon dates for because all of the excavations that took place at Loch Crew under Conwell, etc., and Raftery, uh, took place in the pre uh, uh, in the pre DNA, obviously era, and also in the pre uh, carbon dating era. But it is likely now based on this and the the uh, the Carrow Keel findings. Um, the Sligo findings. It is likely that we will find in the future that some of the uh, uh, some of those interred at Loch Crew, that's if all of the bones weren't destroyed. And you know, I'm not sure if the bones from the uh, Conwell excavations were kept anywhere or whether they were just discarded. At some point, we may find bone fragments in one of those, and we may find uh, the relationships there again in the DNA. I'm just ch checking through the any if there are any questions. The ancients global warming or cooling crisis says Neil. Yeah, uh, there certainly was a uh, we 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 we, we co I can't remember which episode it was. We covered it in. It, it there was definitely a, a, a downturn. Uh, it got colder and wetter in the latter part of the Neolithic. Debbie Daly is asking: Did the research happen to identify the specific haplo group of the bones? Um, I, I, I don't even have my notes. I took notes at Dr. Cassidy's talk in Slain. I don't have my notes to hand. I would imagine yes, but none of the press release material today about this says that. And as I said, I don't have access to the Nature uh, article. So I cannot answer that. And actually a number of people are asking that. Hey, Ken, I'm not sure if you can answer that question. Uh, if there's any identity of the haplo group uh, among the, and we, we can't talk here about uh, um, uh, haplo groups simply because we don't have the information to hand, unfortunately. King Arthur, Christina Zaba says, King Arthur, in some early versions, slept with his sister Morgan Le Fay, and their son Mordred was the downfall 
of the round table. Interesting stuff, Christina. Thank you. Catherine says, did we say that already, Catherine? If I'm repeating this, uh, I apologize. Taboos are sometimes there for good reasons, especially when we are in trying times. Breaking them can drive down, can driving down into even deeper doo-doo. <laughs> Where did the mound builders come from? We're told that there was a gradual migration across the, what we call the European continent today from Turkey, where the earliest Neolithic sites are found. And they're, uh, I, I don't know, they're uh, 10, approximately 10,000 years old, some of them. Um, uh, so uh, they, they came across Europe from um, the Near East. Is there a chance of competition in regards to monument size? Perhaps one group trying to outsize the other, asks Larissa. <laughs> I wonder about that, yes. It is a, pecu a peculiar thing um, that now, th if you consider that Newgrange, as we've said, is the one that sort of has all of the stardom of the mythology. It seems to be the centre of things in the myths. Uh, and, of course, it has ended up being the sort of centrepiece of the complex in terms of visitor numbers. Uh, Nouth is bigger and has more megalithic art. One wonders whether there wasn't a competition going on uh, between perhaps rival factions of this uh, dynasty. Who knows? Uh, I suppose uh, we could speculate about such things. Um, it, it, I think it's certainly a possibility. It looks like a lot of the genetic testing info is in the original article. Kristen Gray Taggart has provided a link. I tried to get into the article today and all I could read was the abstract. So if there is a, a longer version of it, I really would love to see that. Uh, so that's very interesting too. Uh, Movanway points out uh, that um, the Dedanans were said to have built Newgrange as a burial place for Dog de Moor, their chief, and his three sons. Yes, indeed. Aid, Angus, and Kermit. Julie asks, could we be dealing with Angus here? Yes, indeed, it's a, a possibility. Uh, I mean, if if they were considered divine, uh, you, you know, um, then it is perhaps possible that there was an individual in the Neolithic. I'm just speculating. Of course, you have to remember the language. The language makes everything very difficult. You know, common belief that, you know, Irish is introduced, you know, it stems out of Proto-Indo-European and that written language only comes with the Christians in the what, 5th century AD. Um, you know, yeah, an entire episode of its own, I think. Early dates from Caramore are controversial. I think Hensey and Berg's reanalysis re sorry, Ken, shows the main passage tomb activity between 3400 and 3100 or thereabouts. Okay, so not, so largely contemporary with Bruno Bonia then. Yeah, very good. Connie says he was in Austin, Texas, as always enjoy your lectures. <laughs> Didn't mean this as a lecture, more just a conversation, but I'm glad you're enjoying it anyway. The goddess Anya was raped by Ailil. She bit his ear to blemish his kingship, says Brona Murray. I did not know that, Brona. Thank you for the information. Was the Boyne Valley chosen for a specific reason, says Mark? Oh, there's a few episodes there. Um, uh, but very briefly, it, it was probably chosen. Uh, uh, the location of Bruna Bonia is on a major river, navigable, tidal, uh, close to the sea. Uh, in other words, a port, you've got access there to the sea. And it is located in the richest agricultural land, the most productive agricultural land in Ireland. And if you are a farming community, you would value that greatly.
everybody there's people complaining about the feed fro- freezing I, I'm not sure why that's happening I can't do anything about it unfortunately would be cool to get Lara on for a guest spot says Sally Siggins yes it would and in fact I would love to do that I will not do it in the next week or so because I know uh, when 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 I was at the centre of attention uh, of the world's media after Drone Henge I didn't have a spare moment for myself for three weeks. I, I honestly didn't. That lady is going to be answering call after call after call and email after email after email. She's going to be very busy for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I'll give her a chance to uh, take a breather afterwards and we'll get her on. Uh, we'll, well, we'll invite her on uh, to one of the episodes uh, in maybe a few weeks time or so. Megan Walter says, tidal is important. No fighting to get up the river. Just wait for the tides. And what are the tides connected with? The moon. And who is the goddess of the, the Boyne? Boan, who has distinct riverine and uh, lunar uh, um, attributes. Uh, see, Island of the Setting Sun 2020 edition. Uh, shortly, shortly going to print. I've been working on uh, just uh, uh, getting it prepared for print. This would seem like a, a good moment to mention it and paste it in as a link for those of you who want to pre-order your copy. Catherine Woodruff makes a good point. It sounds like it doesn't sound like she went willing in the myth. Yes. And in fact, Catherine, the, uh, the Dunchenicus myth of doubt doesn't even name the sister, you know. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Kathy May Dayo says, this was amazing. I'll watch the beginning when I get home from work tonight. I love this stuff. My lunch is over. Need to get back to work. Good night, all. Tua and Mr. Murphy. Kathy, thank you for joining us. And it appears Facebook is overloading. I think, uh, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I am going to leave it at that. I think there's probably more stuff that we could talk about. Um, but uh, it is an hour and 26. Uh, and as excited as I am about it, uh, and ex as excited I, as I know you probably are about it too um, I think we may leave it there we'll go to the annals tomorrow uh, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we'll just re re return to this subject if there are any developments on it uh, in the next uh, 24 hours we'll come back to it tomorrow evening in the meantime don't forget that tomorrow is episode 99 and Friday all going well if everything goes to plan we're having episode 100 for which there is no set plan the plan is that you and you, you, all you guys and I are just going to talk and have a chat. I'm going to probably have a drink here while I'm. I'll have a glass of wine while I'm chatting. We'll open the discussion. Uh, we'll we'll have a bit of fun. Uh, if there's anything people want me to read, I'll read it. I'll take requests, as it were. I'm not singing any songs, right? We'll just have a community celebration uh, of the 100th episode. And we'll let it go whatever way it goes. We won't script it. We won't plan it. We'll just have a, a nice time together. In the meantime, remember, keep washing your hands. Keep using hand sanitizer. Uh, watch your cough and sneeze etiquette, which is something I've been forgetting to mention. Sneeze and cough into the back of your elbow like that. Uh, make sure you don't spread your germs when you're outside. Uh, physical or social distancing. Keep two meters apart from each other. And if you're going anywhere uh, other than your home that involves interaction with other people, it is definitely best to wear a mask that covers both your nose and your mouth. Don't cut any holes in it. Don't inject yourself with Parazone. Don't do anything silly like that. Keep yourself safe and well. Keep coming back to Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Mythical Ireland. It's been a great pleasure. What a fantastic day it has been for revelations and finally answering some of the deepest questions about Newgrange. I hope you agree. We'll see you all tomorrow night. Ichawa, Kolosov, August, Sloan, Gafol, Macharjigal, Lair, Arfodon, Down.